Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Supply at Me Capital PLC Annual General Meeting. Throughout this recorded meeting, attendees will be in listen-only mode. I'd now like to hand you over to the Chairman, Albert Ganyushin. Good morning to you, sir. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to welcome you to the Annual General Meeting of Supply at Me Capital PLC, which has been convened by the notice of the Annual General Meeting dated 31st May 2023. I am Albert Ganyushin, and I shall be chairing this meeting, which I shall hereafter refer to as this AGM. Before we move on with the formal business of the AGM, I would like to introduce my colleagues from the board. To my right is um, the, the newest joiner uh, of the board is Alexandra Gallagher. To my left is obviously the CEO of the company, Alessandra. Morning. And joining us online, I hope, are um, David Bull and um, Enrico Camilleneri. At this time, uh, as the time the convening of the AGM is 11 a.m., and this time has now passed, and as the quorum of the members is present, I would like to declare this AGM open. The business of this AGM is set out in the notice of the AGM, which with your agreement, I propose to take as read. If anyone wishes to object, please raise your hand now. Thank you. The board will now be pleased to deal with any questions arising from the annual report and other resolutions that are set out in the notice. <clears throat> and on any other points, shareholders or their duly appointed representatives may wish to raise. The board notes that several questions, <coughs> excuse me, received in advance of this AGM have been previously addressed. As you know, in the investor presentation on the 25th of May. And the board does not propose to go through those again. Please, would the questioners identify themselves when you ask the question? And if you're not a shareholder, please state the name of the shareholder you are representing. To be fair to everyone who wishes to speak, please restrict the number of questions you might wish to ask and be as brief as possible. I guess I now hand over to the investor meet representative to facilitate the asking of the questions. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please just raise your hands and I will give you the microphone. Thank you, sir. Good morning, Chris Mead, uh, shareholder. Um, basically, I just wonder why none of the board, apart from Alessandro and some uh, share dealings, um, the rest of the board have ever bought, according to notifications, any shares in Supply at Me, yet they're happy to take a salary each month um, without any skin in the game. And that, to me, seems wrong. Every other company I've invested in, um, an incoming chairman or board member would normally buy a stake in the company. And you know, as a suffering shareholder who bought at a slightly higher price, um, I'm just wondering why this is sort of across the whole board of Supply at Me um, and individually why you haven't bought shares. Shall I answer this question? Yes, please. Thank you for the, thank you for the question. Um, it is a very fair question, completely. I, I agree with the genesis of the question. I guess the ram I, I don't really know, to be honest, what the real answer is. I would like to address the question head on. I can give you some background of the mitigating circumstances as to why I think it might have happened so far. That is not to promise you that it will happen tomorrow. But uh, one of the issues that um, anyone on the board we, uh, faces when considering buying shares in the company is 
actually uh, the moments when you can do that are extremely limited. Yeah, we I'm are. In the city, I know. Yeah, but I would say particularly in our company where we kind of almost effectively always in the restricted period because if something might happen tomorrow, you know, the inside information. Um, so I think this is the greatest, you know, greatest issue from my point of view that I don't want to go into what I'm basing this on. Just perhaps trust me that this, this has been, we considered doing this a few times actually different members of the board and faced with this issue that you know you can't do it now you have to wait and quite often a considerable amount of time so there are technical complications that is not to say answering your question head on that if one was wanted to pull out all the stops and find you know a handful of days in a year that you can do it you cannot do it you can of course do it uh, but it's not easy in our situation. I think this is a significant mitigating factor, honestly, in my opinion. Um, but that said, um, I would like to obviously see uh, the board, you know, make an investment in the company um, because the signaling um, around that is very important. So I think we understand that, I'd like to address it and hope we'll be at some point in the future in the position to address it, recognizing that we have not yet done it. I mean, I appreciate the honest answer. Um, although, uh, looking looking at other companies, it's um, not the case, and and they have RNSs possibly more regularly than we do. And and I do understand there's things happening, but there's things happening in every company: signing contracts, new contracts happening, discussions ongoing. Yet, directors in those companies are allowed to, but the Supply at me one seems to be the only one where you, we've hidden behind this now for two and a half years. And I'm sure within the two and a half years, uh, there have been um, some some timescales. And I mean, you know, they're, they're, it's pretty lenient, you know, apart from the, you know, two months before the report and accounts, whatever it is, or 90 days or 30 days. Um, I forget now. But, you know, there are, you know, it is set down and I, uh, the contracts are always happening in every company. Glaxo would be selling and buying contracts, but the directors still buy and sell shares. They don't wait for the next contract, the contract after that, and the contract after that, and the contract after that. So I, I thank you for your honest answer, but I'm not sure it's totally true that it's such a small window and every time you try and do it, the window's closed or or whatever. Um, because you know, I have worked in the city and I, I know it is not that difficult to find those periods. And, and the contract thing is, is a little bit of a smokescreen because every other company has ongoing discussions with suppliers, funders, or whatever else we're discussing with. But... Yeah, yeah I, I, I don't propose to get into a lengthy exchange on this, but you know, you know, you would recognize as a shareholder that the, that the amount of new material contracts that we have done is not that huge. And so it's not a Glaxo situation where thousands of contracts are coming through. If that was the case in our position, I would agree with you entirely. But I just make a point. We are, you know, we continue to be a company at an inflection point where a, a lot of the information that we have access to is genuinely insider information, in my opinion. As a shareholder, I'd just like to Point is noted, understood and acknowledged. Questions from the room. Um, Matthew Martin, shareholder. <clears throat> I guess um, what I'm struggling with at the minute is to actually put a valuation on the company. And I know that's standard for this type of company in this industry. However, when I invested the best part of half a million two years ago, um, I had captive bank, I had RNSs with quantums of potential IMs. So I could I could quite easily put a valuation and determine that the company was undervalued. Since the last revenue guidance, we've got nothing. We've got two one million IMs. I would say almost radio silence. Uh, this kind of you know silver bullet of white label, but I don't even know if it's two million, two hundred million. 
So, I, so I'm kind of locked in with a significant loss. I have no idea if the company is even worth the shares, the share price today, because the level of information that you guys give me and everyone is pitiful. Maybe if I answer the okay. Thank you. Thank you, mate. Uh, I think that uh, we start this year with uh, the business update uh, that maybe was uh, uh, weighted from the investors, and we tried to map our agenda. As uh, you know, I try also to, to, to explain to, to the shareholders, you know, in these uh, in these months. So actually. In a perspective of an investor, as a shareholder, I think that the, the agenda is clear. Is in the January business update, and what we are doing now, maybe with the expectation of time that is uh, always not always in our control, is to deliver this agenda. And I think, uh, Matthew, that uh, respect to two years ago, one year ago, the situation in terms also of uh, projections of what the company, the group, can do is totally different. So, so technically. We made the first IM uh, in Italy with the traditional funding. We uh, announced the UK funding. Uh, we are in line uh, with the UK execution as the uh, market knows. In the business update, uh, we said that is 10 million, the, 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 the first uh, agreement uh, of first potential transaction with the, the tier one bank, as uh, we said in the presentation of 25 May, unfortunately, the technology device, the hardware didn't work. And so we, we are not able to pass transfer the enthusiasm and the, you know, the direction that we are following. And, uh, and I think that as we are doing also, in the, in the seat, in the company with the partners is to try to, to explain that uh, really delivering something the company can scale, you know, because uh, uh, we prove uh, UK, we prove uh, Italy, we prove uh, or we will prove the uh, white label, uh, also the, the opportunity to work with the tier one bank. And as you know, if you as investor, you try to project something, say, OK, the financial service is a market of followers. So if uh, we announce a good alliance with a, a bank, for sure, other banks will uh, knock the door saying, I want to do the same. Maybe as we were saying these days from the commercial banks, maybe also investment banks can uh, start to work together because they see a, a model that actually is working. And so technically, uh, we hope uh, that we'll be in position this year also to maybe put some numbers and uh, help also, obviously, the, the market participants, the shareholders, uh, all our partners to see our trajectory um, and, and continue to support the company. Because we are in a crucial moment, guys, and we need to be supported because the company now is delivering and we need, we need really now support of all shareholders, partners to go in the direction that we are working we will be talking uh, three years basically now. So this is my view, Matthew. Thanks, Alessandro. Um, I guess, given cash position, um, my concern is by having no revenue guidance imminently, we are staring right down the barrel of another uh, raise. And historically, the raises have been at a dis you know a disgracefully low price relative to what I paid. So I just need some kind of confidence soon from the company that we're not going to run out of money and need another fundraise. I, I, I'm fully confident in the company. I've got total, uh, I, I get where it's going and I get that the things take time with banks, but I need something and we need something as shareholders that, that makes us realize, okay, this is taking time, but we're not about to just go, go to the markets or I want to say the market Venus uh, to get additional funds because we're not going to be able to pay everyone's salaries. That's my last point. Uh, I, th I think that basically we are in June and we recently approved the annual report, you know, with the, the facilities that uh, the funding facilities that we, we announced, right? So in this moment, uh, and you know that the company has the obligation you know, to, 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 to disclose something, if uh, something that we uh, approved uh, uh, in the past changed, right? So actually, now the company is this, in the same position of the what we announced in the annual report, and we we, we don't see any, you know, we, we don't see the, what you are, you know, now thinking that uh, 
will, uh, will happen. Also, additionally, as uh, you appreciated, like happened last year, starting to work with banks, open the doors also to commercial loans that actually is something that Banco BPM last year provided us. Uh, the market is seeing what we are doing uh, and there are a lot of opportunities to work also in a normal manner, ordinary you know, course of business with the normal loans. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that this is uh, the direction that we approved also in the last annual report. Uh, and we are now uh, we do, we do not we do need to you know target our you know goals business goals that uh, when the board approved the annual report as you know there is a working capital assessment uh, going concern analysis uh, and our focus uh, really is now on revenue is not to see how we can raise capital i find another providers is we need revenue and we need uh, to generate cash from revenue not from other type of facilities this is a key message that is important that you can uh, appreciate today, right? Hi there. Um, my name is Sasha Kovlovich, um, shareholder. Uh, you know, I was here last year at the AGM last year, and um, I mentioned that, uh, I mean, what I do is I buy companies anyway, and there's one company that's, a multi-million revenue um, PC manufacturer. And I was assured by um, your colleagues that we will get a call to talk about a potential um, IM. 365 days later, I'm still waiting for that call. And I also asked you, um, by the way, I appreciate the, this access that we do get, and I know you're very generous with it, Alessandro, so we're you know, really grateful and thankful for that. Um, what are you actually doing in terms of uh, the the outreach to the potential market? I mean, just last week I was at uh, the NEC for the NACFB Expo, which is National Association of Commercial Finance Brokers. Over 4,000 people attended. And I was uh, just generally chatting. I was chatting to the, uh, the director and the chairman of that organization. They've got I think about you know a few thousand members. And if you think of all the businesses that those members look after, nobody not one single person had heard of Supply Me Capital. So what are you actually doing in the marketplace and the outreach? Because anything that we see online about, oh, you know, look at this. And, you know, we go on LSC. I'm sure, you know, we're all under our kind of pseudonyms or whatnot. And, you know, somebody gets excited because some you really kind of niche website puts up a, a press release, which it's just not that uh, chat GPT could knock out 50 of those in 30 seconds. So what are you actually doing in terms of the marketing and what are you doing in the, following on from an earlier question, but it's still related. What are you actually doing in terms of speaking with tier one banks for your white label uh, proposition? I, I know understand, you know, commercial confidentiality, even though, you know, this room should be a lock, a locked room sort of thing and nothing gets out. But in terms of what quality and what uh, types of banks and financial institutions are you actually talking to? And can you give us an indication of how advanced? So I suppose the two questions in summary are what you're doing on the PR marketing side, sales side, and then on the other side, who are you actually speaking to for the white label proposition? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, uh, very clear uh, questions, right? Um, I think that uh, we need uh, now to uh, deploy a model that uh, since uh, we are paid to generate revenue, okay, we need to find the right way to speed up the generation of revenue. And uh, our view now is that uh, in order to reduce the time to delivery of these transactions uh, or to the opportunity to deliver a, a, um, an IM, it's important uh, to have uh, you know, funders, that uh, also can originate clients, right? So the white label that actually is a self-funding mode, just to clarify, because we tried also to clarify in the Q&A, it's not white label as a technology, but what we are doing now is to work with the, uh, these uh, players in order to allow to deliver inventory monetizations, leveraging the client base of the, the bank, right? So in, in this manner, if you can follow this trajectory, we are now uh, proving that uh, in Italy and uh, soon in UK, the model can work, right? 
then uh, with do these two technically tools, uh, we can, uh, and we are doing, uh, uh, you know, since uh, one year actually, the activities in Italy with the uh, local banks that are tier one banks, so are one of the 100 uh, systemics banks in, under the European Central Bank uh, regulation, to, to give you a, an idea of type of uh, balance sheet that can banks, these banks can, can have, right? And uh, this is for Italy, and we want to do the same of UK. Obviously, the, as you know, financial services always said, le please, let me see if you are doing something also small, you know, initially to you know, knock uh, and uh, start the, 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 this new model. And then I can work because I also be facilitated internally as a bank to show to my compliance officer, risk management, you know, that regulation are asking new product procedures for banks. You know, since two years ago, there is a, basically a new framework. You know, when a bank needs to launch, launch a new product, uh, start basically a, a official procedures, and they have to inform also the regulators in some cases, right? Because then they need to do a business, business plan and so on and so forth. So actually, what we are doing is uh, deliver this, this basically this uh, not proof of concept because are real transactions. So I don't like the term proof of concept, to, to be honest, when I saw someone say that you did the, the proof of concept. We did, the, we help real economy. There are now two and hopefully soon three companies that are, are, we are monetized in venture and we are helping the real economy. Proof of concept is something more, you know, in my opinion, more that from a garage of Steve Jobs. This is something that we are delivering, right? I, so this is the first one. Then after this, uh, with the banks, uh, I can confirm with these banks, uh, it's totally different now discussing. Because the question is, uh, can I see the term sheet of the note that you issued? Can I see the, how are the conditions, how works the model? And the, the time to reply to these banks now is totally different. Because uh, last year, we tried to say, yes, uh, we are trying. Maybe if you simulate, if you do this forecast. Now we have live transactions. And we say, okay, this is the what we are doing, and you will see the speed of delivery, in my opinion, in the in the next months. How we can speed up the alliances with banks, in my opinion. Regarding the marketing, is a, one of the topic in the table of the board of directors. I can see, I can say, you know, because uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, is important, regardless the opportunity to work with them. Um, banks uh, or to do transaction to be you know uh, our presence need to be you know in a, every table or you know online physically obviously there is a emmy in the in the room uh, is important to have you have a budget uh, we need to, to you know invest the money uh, use the money in when there is a, a return of investment very high in this moment and so we prefer to invest uh, the the money in order to speed up maybe an alliance with a funder and then invest the money in the future also for maybe more wider marketing or PR, because now we need uh, really to uh, manage our pipeline, right? The problem uh, or the opportunity now is not to find new clients, is to have fuel to deliver the pipeline, right? And so this is uh, our priority now. Uh, and uh, indirectly with the revenue, with what we'll do, We'll have a, maybe a budget to, to improve also the more general marketing approach. But uh, in these days, the, the board is discussing uh, to improve, as usual, the, the marketing activities in general uh, using our existing budget. Um, you're not actually doing any active marketing right now. Actually, uh, to be very honest, uh, I think that uh, we are lucky because uh, we continue to, re to get uh, requests of inventory monetization from corporates, uh, uh, naturally, from the, our network of originators uh, uh, recently uh, before wrote me last week, another before wrote me to uh, introduce new clients uh, to us, UK clients. So actually, it's not uh, a big deal for us uh, now fund, uh, fund every week, uh, every month, uh, new clients. So uh, maybe it's not a perception of the shareholders, but in reality, the number, uh, the number of uh, originators that we have in Italy and also in UK, the ecosystem that we have now is continuing to generate opportunity. Uh, differently, if you're saying uh, it's important to have a market positioning, uh, regardless the fact that to have a to onboard a new client or a new prospect to have a market positioning in 
in these events that you are saying. And uh, this is a more a brand market positioning that uh, I do agree that maybe regardless the fact to, to have another client, it's important to see the Suple Me in these uh, events, in these tables. And we'll do, we'll do for sure something in the future using our budget of marketing. Other questions in the room? Yeah, this is non-football related. Um, Matthew Martin, again, sh shareholder. Um, would it be fair to say that uh, if there wasn't for if there wasn't the white label opportunity, supply of me would be really struggling uh, right now because we've kind of almost transitioned from the traditional funder slash captive bank, um, and now it seems like we're basically everything's on the line for white label. So no white label equals supply of me would be in a bad place right now. Would that be fair? No, no iPhone and Apple will uh, maybe default, you know, right? And no, basically, the point uh, is not is not a, ra a random situation. Uh, is a strategy of the company to study the market, understanding the time to to deliver of each funding routes. We know last year that to speed up the first uh, IM, we leverage the crypto market basically because uh, we had the opportunity not to raise funds through tokens, but to have opportunity to help uh, the first company with uh, our original model, uh, regardless uh, to use uh, an NFT or some un uh, other, you know, as a funding route. So is a, I think that was a clever strategy of the board to say, firstly, last year, find the more, the faster route to do the first IM. Secondly, now find the faster route to scale. Third, find a, a faster route to scale or, or horizontally, maybe with uh, multi-jurisdictions, because uh, in a 25 May disaster of presentation that we made, let me do, I'm joking a bit, but actually uh, the, 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 was, was a, mis a great misunderstanding, you know, the white label uh, up and running multiple regions 24, you remember, because... Uh, I received uh, thousands of messages in uh, 10 minutes, the worldwide record of messages. Okay, so actually, but this is the point. The, the board of directors are setting strategy long term and short term because the focus are revenue, cash position, and obviously the improvement of our unique product, right? As a platform. Yeah, I can uh, maybe add just a little bit on this. <coughs> I don't think it's right what, you know, the, the hypothesis you put forward. Uh, but we certainly, you know, within the board and the strategy meetings that we've had, obviously, since certainly since the year I joined, you know, I've been here, and Alessandro was, was talking about that. I think the focus has been, because we understand that the, the company has significant promise and has a unique product but it has to work and has to be brought to market. Now we thought about what are the drivers behind effectively the delays in the adoption of the company's product. And one of those drivers is in the captive model, we basically need to build a financial services brand, financing brand. Yeah, and let's be honest about this, it's not corporate customers as you know hoovering them up you know we have plenty of corporate customers it's the financing financial services brand and for those of you who you know have the city experience they understand this actually is you know this does take time because it's a function of track record uh, trust and perception and that is something that could happen quickly but it could also take time because this is a little bit how you know a lot of factors outside of our control forgive me um so with this in mind the white label approach um seems to bring us to the adoption of the product much quicker and probably help both on either side you must understand because if the approach with the white label well we the platform and other people have both the customer and the money. Why would they not use our platform 
if it's so good after all? That is a reasonable question we ask in the board. This, I, I ask this question. And for this reason, yeah, I think it is important for us. It's not, if it doesn't work, then everything goes to pieces. But I think it can accelerate significantly our development because, you know, frankly, if, 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 if a big institution takes on our platform, without shadow of doubt, this is a significant vote and validation of the credibility of the platform for everyone for the captive as well, right? Um, and for other white label opportunities. So it is important strategically, no question about it, uh, in, in validating our product, in, in speeding up the adoption of the product. But if it doesn't happen, it doesn't kill the concept, it doesn't you know, destroy the journey that we're on, but I think it is important catalyst for our development. I hope this is clear. Thank you. So, last question, but I'll probably put three in. So uh, firstly, um, you, you, funding, that's always been my big issue and why uh, I invested because of the captive bank four billion opportunity of funding in 2020. Um, still waiting on that one. Um, so and, and also, I don't think as a shareholder, I've been really updated on progress of the captive bank, the, the, just the odd snippet in the odd half yearly or annual report saying it's still bubbling um but it seems to have bubbled for an awful long time and i wonder if it's evaporated in which case we need to be be told it has you know not happening or or some more solid updates on it because at the end of the day you, you supply me talks about updating the market actually we're the shareholders and we're the owners of the company and it, you should be updating us rather than the market because, you know, I know the two things are, are similar, but we do own the company and we do have, you know, uh, a right to understand what's going on. I know some of it has to be kept secret, of course it does, but other bits like the captive bank, you know, I mean, that has just been going on and on and on. And the fintech banks sort of came and went and, and uh, one or two other bits and pieces. Um, so I, I suppose that's my first plea that you actually keep us the shareholders a little bit more updated on what's happening. The second thing is the the pipeline, the 300 million. Um, these guys have got an awful lot of patience. You know, they've been 2020 to 2020, three and a half, and they're still sitting there in the pipeline. And we've done a whole, you know, one and a half, three, I think it's four and a half million um, compared to 300 million pipeline. Is that a real figure? Because I would be getting a little bit bored and questioning the whole opportunity thing by just sitting in a pipeline for three years waiting for my my uh, my stock to be done and then the last one is trade flow um when will we hear what is happening with trade flow uh, just a date and then a simple question which i'm sure you can't answer but will it be cash flow positive neutral or negative to sign the trade flow split thank you you raised <laughs> four. Four, four, four. Four. The, the four we can't reply i just uh, anticipate <laughs> so no uh, no good questions uh, chris as usual uh the, the captive bank the fintech bank uh, i can add uh, also such uh, if you want uh, uh, so the, the insurance company the the agency in italy you, you, i think that the, the shareholder has to see this as a needs of of our business, as we were saying, to work closely with the bank, right? So I reply you with a, a question or, you know, a, 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 a say something regarding what will happen if one of the, these banks where we are now working will ask us to work very close on exclusivity basis uh, for a specific maybe supply chain, right? Actually, if this will happen, Technically, we are delivering the, the model of a captive bank, you know, working together with the bank that actually is a, our basically partner to deliver something in a specific sector. Because captive bank, to be clear, you remember, it was not that Supplemi were bought by a bank or Supplemi bought a bank. It was a, an agreement where an external funders bought a bank, taught in a whole, wholly or partially, in order to allow Supplemi to have a captive funding available to deliver basically IMs to pipeline existing or to 
eligible clients, right? This, is, this was the strategy with Quadrivia, basically. But uh, the same framework, also because, uh, you know, uh, I remember, you know, the, the announcement was September after my birthday, uh, 21, of 2020, 21 of September and December 2020, when we named Quadrivio. These guys are all are in the market, right? Basically, are equity, private equity investors. And banks, technically, are there are some banks also with private equity funds behind, right? So what we, I'm saying is that our strategy to work together with the local banks is actually a way to deliver, basically, this framework, okay? And, and let's see what will happen if there are banks uh, that will, work, will want to work together with Supreme more closely. On the other hand, as we said in, uh, I think, in the last uh, Q&A or, or, or in the past, uh, the Avanga Group and Quadrivio always are looking for opportunities to help uh, Supreme working with the banks that can uh, work closely with uh, Supreme, right? But to find a, a bank uh, is not easy, you know? because uh, there are a lot of banks with MPL, uh, MPL uh, portfolio to clean up. Uh, there are complex situations. The regulators is, uh, you know, is also asking more credit restrictions. So the, the environment obviously changed, but the need to work closely with the bank uh, is basically the strategy that we are, now we are delivering. Um, Treflo, this is the second, right? Treflo, tre, Treflo. Uh, we announced the, you know, the, what we are doing with Reflow and Tom and, and John. And uh, I think that the, the, together we are working to find the right solution in order to, you know, again, uh, update the market, you know, of what we want to do together or maybe in another configuration, as uh, we said in the RNS that we, we published. There is also a technical legal due date as uh, you know you know in the in the agreements uh, and in the also in the you know relationship and we are you know in line with this due date you know to finalize uh, uh, you know this uh, basically uh, basically this uh, reconfiguration so we will inform the market and do course uh, in line with this uh, technical legal due date uh, the third one I, I didn't remember because I'm impact, passionate of banking. The impact yeah. of trade flow, but I think yeah. uh, the answer is. Yeah, pipeline, pipeline, the pipeline. Uh, yeah, no, pip pipeline. I think that uh, after three years where we improved a lot of the governance, uh, also thanks to uh, the new chair, new board of directors, Amy, Stuart, uh, I think, uh, Chris, I don't want to be rude. It isn't acceptable to get an, a, an answer, a, a, a question, say, are true or untrue the numbers, right? The numbers, by definition, are true, you know, because uh, there are auditors, there are procedures. Uh, so it's, uh, I'm, I'm just saying in, a, you know, in genuine reply that uh, all what we are saying, doing is true, you know? So, and the pipeline is, a, is a interesting, your view, saying the passion of the clients. Actually, you can imagine that clients during COVID uh, was funded by the COVID facilities, and so they they was able were able the clients to continue to you know support their working capital uh, you know needs uh, through the funding. This is this creates an opportunity because the COVID facilities was uh, basically a doping you know for for all the corporates uh, in Italy in UK. So basically, they pumped the debt of the clients, and now the clients uh, has to repay the debt. Uh, all the covenant, all the, the problems uh, regarding now clients with the leverage that the banks can, can, can manage. And these clients are more than happy to wait because they wanted to now to the risk to the leverage, you know, this, their position. And, uh, and these are examples, right, where we can work. Uh, uh, some clients maybe ask us uh, to, you know, come back when we are able to deliver. What we are saying in a business are of January, I think that uh, I want to pick up a point that is interesting in your view, where the company said that, that we are starting to see or to work on larger tickets, right? Because to work with the banks, the banks are asking us larger tickets, right? So what we are now discussing with our pipeline is to increase the average ticket of each deal, eh? because our banks are asking minimum tickets that are not 1.8 million, but basically times uh, different, right? So this is a, 
what uh, I think is important in understanding of the pipeline. And also, as we were saying recently, to scale, we will need maybe more, less number of transactions, right, initially, because the average ticket will be, you know, higher. And this is interesting in your perspective, in our perspective, to scale, generate revenue, achieve as soon as possible the break-even, generate free cash flow. This is basically our technically uh, direction, right? One final question in the room. It's just uh, Sasha Akoblovich, shareholder. Um, just picking up on a note that you said earlier, um, kind of, I suppose in relation to what I asked, you, what you're saying is you've. It's not a question of building up a client base of people who require funding. It's more the other side of the coin, the funders. So, with you know the the, the way that the economy is and the high inflation, etc. What is the attraction? What is the offering that you you are giving potential funders to make them think? You know what? Yeah, we'll, we'll chuck you know ten or twenty mil at that just to have a go at it to see how it pans out. What? What active conversations are you having with funders around that? Uh, I, I, our underlying, our product, uh, is a, an interesting uh, opportunity of investment for these funders for, um, because now also discussing with commercial banks and maybe also banks, uh, they, they wanted to offer a new product uh, with their clients. And so we can uh, technically uh, easier you know, to, to, to explain uh, the... You know, they look through the lose the, the the reason why of this product for the clients. So, in the perspective of self-funding of uh, of funders that are commercial banks, uh, there is no brainer, you know, to understand the how a bank can use a, a balance sheet to support uh, their clients that are, are continually asking this type of facility. If you are asking uh, other type of investors, like uh, the investors uh, that invested in this note, uh, technically. The underlying of Supreme is interesting, the inventory monetization, because firstly, is a tool to hedge the inflation, because uh, if the price will go up, uh, technically our model is indexed you know, to this price because the rolling uh, activities buy and sell are aligned. And so we can ensure also an alignment of the interest rate uh, in our notes, as it happened in, our, in these recent uh, you know, transactions. Secondly, is secured and the you know holy grail, uh, maybe as we are saying uh, PNP or whatever, technically are uh, improving uh, the security package uh, of the investment, you know, and so this is uh, interesting in the perspective also of uh, typical debt funds that want to invest into a bond. The third one is the ES ESG goal because helping uh, supply chain, we are basically improving the operational resilience. Of the supply chain, that is one of the ESG goals under you know the framework of ESG assessment, right? So just these three basically factors or drivers are helping a lot to pitch an investment opportunity to not commercial banks that is different as a perspective, but to uh, debt investors that are looking for asset classes, uh, uh, good return, uh, um, investment edge to the inflation, and so on and so forth. This is in my opinion the the main points to pitch uh, and that I think that are supporting a lot. And just maybe, maybe just one line, you know, if you ask me and I come from the wholesale effectively background, right, some financial markets, what is the value proposition of the company? And I think if it's helpful, I can give my two liner. It's equity release of the capital tied into the stocks or inventories of the company. And that equity release is effectively not possible to achieve through traditional bank loans because of lack of control over collateral fraud and all sorts of things. What this, our platform um, allows, um, we believe, is that equity release. Now, a bank can get access to that equity release by lending against this behind our platform effectively through a note or a non-bank fund that can do that. So that's what it allows. So therefore, the sort of returns we are looking to provide to funders are equity-style returns um, when the notes are being printed into the SPVs that are financing those monetizations. They're equity-style returns. And that is attractive. 
for sure, is attractive to a bank, it's attractive to a non-bank um, financing institution. So it's an equity release. Yeah. The kind of, I suppose, the crux of the question is, are you in active conversations with you know, investors and finance houses? Of course. I mean, it would be remiss on us not to do that. So um, we kind of try to explain before, and I'm very happy to reiterate this very clearly to you. And we as a board, as a, in, you know, I speak as independent board directors, um, try to hold the management team very tightly accountable as to what we are doing in terms of actually addressing this specific you know, development objective from the company's point of view. And that is, we want to have partners on the captive side who are trying the transactions, coming back, participating more, and upping their commitment. So we want to build a stable of people who will finance the transactions that we originate. That is what you see in the pipeline. That is our own originated transactions. But we also want people to come with our own transactions because there will be people who will second guess us and will say, well, have these guys have chosen all the companies that uh, nobody wants to finance? And what do they know of supply me capital? You know, small little company. We are a big bank, X, Y, and Z, and we know what we want to do. We just can't do it because otherwise, you know, they have to have access to our platform and technology. In which case, I would say to Alexander, we're happy to put our hands up and say, well, come with your client and with your capital and, and do it because we can deliver it. Hope that makes sense. One more question, I think, from the room, sir. One last question. Yes. Hi, Paul Cook, shareholder. May I go? I did have a question, but I'd like to first go back to the trade flow capital situation. Uh, clearly, these things are never easy, either joining or leaving. Um, one might have a hypothesis, given that you've been discussing this for nine months, that if it was easy, it would already be sorted. Um, and there is an end date, so which was alluded to in the answer to Chris. It's just how hard is that end date? And if we go past that end date, are we going to litigation? Um, the, um, Shall I answer that? Yeah, 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 please. So, because I, I, I will take the answer because uh, I'll give you the answer because Alessandro has obviously had a long standing relationship with the guys. And I, I'm, I think, I hope I can take a slightly more detached approach, which may be helpful for you. Uh, look, I, you know from the announcement, it's clear that we are trying to separate. Uh, for what we hope are strategic reasons, and we m try to make it very clear. Um, we would like to separate, you know, via the friendly agreement. And we believe uh, we will, this is what we will deliver as a board. Okay. Notwithstanding that, the other party has a, a, a a right to separate from us actually also on the terms to be agreed but when somebody says i actually have a right to run away from you it's you know slightly more uh you know it's a it's a separation with a little bit more tension as you would appreciate than otherwise would have been so i believe we will separate um as we said we have to announce the terms and conditions and you know in due course we'll do that and we are working on still on option a whereas option b also does exist so it's going to be either option a or option b but actually in reality it's going to have to be a separation either way so it's kind of it's Im almost immaterial right so in the round of things as to what, how this would happen is, is the date a hard date or a soft date? The date, the date simply is a date um, when um, the other party has certain control over the timetable. And I think it would be fair to say that both parties want to separate. So if, one, if the other party wants, also wants to separate, it is their power to... Uh, use that trigger, which is why 
it is kind of a, 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 a stop date, kind of a stop date. Not really in technical terms, but practically it is a stop date. So if that's clear. Thank you for that. Uh, my question is, which I'd like to ask, is there are some well-known personalities in social media who, and we don't need to discuss who they are or their credibility, um, but there is a narrative that there has been significant um, I hesitate to find the right word that's been significant activity in terms of uh, share trading um, over the over the period so the question the question is does the company monitor the trading of its shares that's the first question do you monitor how your shares are being traded and Okay. So the second question is, are you aware of any intriguing patterns that seem to repeat? But if you don't monitor it, the answer to the second question is no. Okay. okay. So, so I will just, uh, I will try to give a quick answer. Look, we as a board, we're responsible for the company, the compliance, the, doing things correctly, disclosing everything correctly, <laughs> delivering strong governance so you can trust us. You can trust us and other people can trust us, right? Yeah. So, but the, look, the trading platform is responsible for trading. So this question should be addressed to LSE. I used to work with big stock exchanges. That is the question for LSE. So you, as you know, we moved from the quotation-driven system, which is based on market maker quotes, to an electronic order book sets. One of the reasons um, that I very much supported this move is this is in a, an equalizer in some ways, right? So it's an electronic order book. Everyone has to put the orders through, and there's visibility on the order book, actually, if you wanted to see it. I'm not interested in it as a company, as supply, supply me capital, but if anyone is interested in it, they should be able to see the through the electronic order book. Do I believe it is helpful in a sense you know, to, to make some of this speculation go away, you know, probably. But if somebody wants to talk negatively about you without any substance, then generating more substance does not necessarily make them go away. You know, if you, if you think it's black and it's white, but it is in fact white, you will continue saying it's black no matter what, I, you know, what evidence I produce. That makes sense. Okay. So thank you. Um, I think now we'd just like to move on with, uh, with, the, the, with the AGM, if, if, um, if we may. So thank you. So this kind of concludes our live Q&A session. So I now propose that we move to ordinary and special business that is set out in the notice of this AGM. And um, want, I want to put all the resolutions to, uh, uh, to be moved today to a vote by Paul. So... I, I hereby officially demand all on behalf of myself as a, a chair in accordance with the Article 61 of the company's Articles of Association. Votes cast for the purpose of a poll include votes cast by proxies. It is my intention as the holder of the number of proxies, in respect of which no direction had been given, to vote the shares represented by such proxies in favor of each of the resolutions. Votes by proxy, discretionary votes and abstentions are shown on the screen behind me, hopefully, as uh, they are for all the resolutions. A poll has been validly demanded and accordingly, I ask our representative from Neville Registars, hello, um, to conduct the poll and act as scrutineers. Resolutions one to nine, inclusive, are proposed as ordinary resolutions and require simple majority to be passed. Resolutions 10 and 11 are proposed as special resolutions, which require to be passed by the majority of 75%
to vote in favor of these resolutions. I now put the resolutions to the AGM and would like to ask those of you voting by polling paper, ensure that your names and the names of the members you are representing are clearly shown on the polling paper, which will be handed to you and indicate by signing the appropriate box whether you vote for or, or against the respective resolutions. Please then hand your polling paper to the representative from the scrutineers who will then collect them. In case of joint holders, would members or, or proxies representing members please write the names of joint other joint holders on the polling paper. I should add that any shareholders present who have submitted proxies by post and who do not wish to alter their votes need not vote in person. Indeed, it will make the vote count easier and simpler if those shareholders who have already submitted proxies refrain from voting by using the polling paper. Will those shareholders requiring polling papers hold up their hands, please? Do do we have resolutions on the screen? Can we move uh, forward the slides a little bit? Yeah. yeah. The resolutions are on the screen. Yeah, so all of those one to nine are ordinary.
picture? Of course. Of course. It's a matter of public record. <laughs> Please carry on. Please carry on, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <laughs> As everyone else had in there. Okay, I think given the, the time constraints now that we, you know, we're now up against the 12 o'clock um, for the uh, general meeting, uh, the, the, for the, I propose the results of the poll will be col collected and counted and the poll will be, the results will be published via the RNS after the AGM closes. So with this, ladies and gentlemen, the business of the AGM is now finished. But in concluding, I would like to thank you all for your continued support to the company. And there's, and there's no further business, and I declare this AGM closed. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you for updating attendees today. On behalf of the Board of Supply at Near Capital, we'd like to thank you for attending today's annual general meeting. And good afternoon to you all.